To ensure that transaction pools are synchronized across users, we'll add the transaction pool to the peer-to-peer -peer server. Luckily, since we already have a synchronized blockchain with the peer-to-peer -peer server, we can use the same model to keep the transaction pools across our users up to date. So let's look at how we're updating the blockchain across users, and then we'll follow the same strategy to keep the transaction pools in line. Let's start by adding a second parameter to the PDP server class constructor, which will be a transaction pool parameter to parallel the blockchain parameter that we have. And likewise, we'll attach a transaction pool object to the class according to the incoming transaction pool for the constructor. Before we continue updating the PDP server class, there's an important detail to consider. The PDP server class depends on a transaction pool to be passed to its constructor, which means that if you look at the main index.js file of our application in the app directory, well, right at the top, now we need to pass this TP instance to our P2P server creation. So make sure to pass the TP instance that is created over here to the P2P server instance that is creating the object for the P2P server class. All right, make sure you have that detail. And then back in the P2P server.js file, let's continue developing the synchronized transaction pool. Let's think about the actual method, which will handle sending transactions to all the individuals on the network. The method will be very similar to this sync chains function that we already have right now, which synchronizes the chains of every individual that is a connected socket to this application. This function sends a user's blockchain to every connected socket which represents a connected user. So we can use the same strategy to send new transaction objects to all the sockets in the network. Now, this method won't send the entire transaction pool, but it will send one individual transaction to everyone. So we'll call the method not sync transactions, but broadcast transaction, since we're only broadcasting one transaction. The function will take one parameter, which is the transaction object that we're broadcasting. Within this function, let's go through each of our socket objects just like we do in sync chains. And then we're going to call a function which will handle actually sending this transaction with the socket object. Now, for each socket within the local array of sockets, we're going to run a function just like we do in sync chains. And then this function will be parallel to the send chain function. But in this case, instead of send chain, it will send the transaction. And likewise, it will have the same argument of the socket object to send with. All right, since we're depending on this send transaction function that we're assuming exists in the class now, let's define it right next to send chain. So send transaction takes one parameter, a socket, and then actually if it's sending a transaction, well, it needs a transaction parameter as well. So this also means that in our broadcast transaction function, we also need to pass in the incoming transaction to our call to this.send transaction. Neat. And now we can use a similar strategy to the send chain. We'll call socket.send. And then this time we'll send the stringified form of the transaction object that we have incoming into the function. All right. Now we come into a bit of a predicament. When we send this transaction over the socket, the message handler of that socket assumes that incoming data that comes in as a message represents a chain. So it attempts to replace a chain with that data right away. However, when we're sending a transaction object, this does not represent a chain. So this will conflict. You won't be able to replace a chain with transaction data. So to solve this problem, we can take the approach of attaching type fields to the data that we send over our messages. The solution has two steps. First, we attach unique type values to each piece of data that we send over a socket. And second, we update the message handler to handle the incoming data according to those types and run different code based off of that. So let's start by going to the top of the file and declaring a new constant that is called message types. Notice that this is screen case to notice or rather to signify 
that this is a global variable to know. The message types constant will be set to an object that contains labels for our various types of data to send over the socket. So first up, let's provide a label for the regular chain data that we're already sending. So we're gonna have a chain key, and then the value can be anything, but how about a screen case chain, just so that we know that this message is a chain message. Likewise, we'll include a type for transaction data. So how about a transaction key? And then to follow the paradigm, we'll have in all caps transaction for the value. Great. So that wraps up message types for the chain and transaction. Now we can use those message types whenever we send data over our sockets. So first up, let's update the send chain method. When we send the stringified object, sending just the chain now won't be enough. We'll create a bigger object that has a type field set to the chain message type for this object. So let's wrap around this blockchain chain. And before we send the chain, this object is going to contain a type. And the type is message types dot chain. And let's indent this just to make it a little clear. So we're sending an overall object. And then likewise, we're going to have a key to say that this object also contains a chain. So overall, we're sending an object that contains a type field, which is set to message types dot chain, which will become that chain string. And then we have a chain field, which is the actual blockchain chain. Now let's do the same thing for our sent transactions to distinguish this kind of data. So we're going to have an overall object. And then this time, the type will be message types dot transaction. So let's add a type. It will be message types dot transaction. And then this time, we're going to want a transaction key that is set to the transaction value that is already coming in. So we can use ES6 destructuring syntax to use the key value shorthand. So that way, a transaction key for this transaction object is set right away. Perfect. Now that we're sending messages over the sockets in a different format, well, now we need to update the message handler function which actually performs functionality based off of receiving those messages. This means that our message handler function will need to handle receiving message objects with different types and then executing the respective code for each kind of message. So let's handle updating the message handler next.